33 years with the state, and then the next three years she spent with the Austin Whittemore Museum, and the last 20 plus years she spent at the Civic Council. Um, so with uh, the not so new face of retirement, Wes Pravacek. I always like to walk up and say, this is, this is retirement. And if I look frazzled, that's what happens. Uh, I, I truly feel like all of you as Rotarians, that you need to be a vital part of the community. And I grew up in a family in Wakanda that was all about that. Uh, small town doesn't mean small time. It means giving, being part of things, getting to know your neighbors, and seeing where there's need, and seeing where there's fun. And I think uh, life is all about that big mix. So uh, when I uh, grew up in that little Mayberry town of Wakanda, I went off to college. And one of the people I met was Dave Lorenz. So uh, he was a college mate. And we're not going to go any further than that. Uh, so then I uh, actually was married to Dr. Al Pravacek's brother and lived in uh, beautiful downtown Winter for almost 20 years. So uh, when the opportunity came to come back to this area, even though my family had moved to Washington State, I came back here with my three daughters because I like it here. And I felt it would be a good community to be a part of again, a safe place to raise three girls and uh, for the education system and for the opportunities we may all have. So uh, enter the jumping into the deep end of the pool and getting involved. So uh, it has been a pleasure for a long time. I'll start with the Civ just because I've been there longer. So I'll time myself so I have my hat on now for Civic Council. You know, you may be aware that it's a thrift store, but it's much more than that. Uh, 92 years ago, this organization started quite small with a group of university wives that knew there was a need for kids to have food and milk. And so they started having their version of rummage sales. And so they could raise some money and give, give that money to where the need was uh, for food and milk. And so they'd have their garage sale wherever they could land. So somebody's garage, somebody's empty business spot. And that's how it all started. So that's the tradition of giving back. And so it went on to the point where it's now been 52 years since we've been incorporated. So it bloomed and it grew and we are a not-for-profit organization that when you donate in the back door, the people come in the front door, I myself bring stuff to the back door, come to the front door, and all the money that's raised in that store uh, pays the wages of about, usually around seven full-time employees. We keep the lights on, pay the taxes, and then the rest of the money comes back into the community. So think about when you're willing to uh, look in your closet and go, yike, something's got to give. Think about giving to the store, because you are giving back to the community when you do that. So today it was my privilege to uh, give a scholarship as well at the high school. Ours is based on volunteerism. So our selection process is, what have you been doing? Uh, my kids got real tired of me telling them that this is the only time I was gonna let them be good for nothing because they needed to learn how to volunteer. And I'm always really amazed and pleased to see that kids are getting involved in the food pantry, the backpack program, their Sunday school programs, their, the 4-H, and all these different things. But this is how we inspire them to do this. And so as we've continued on with the Civic Council, um, our board is made up of, well, we have a membership group, and Cindy Benzel is on our board. Uh, we invite people to have a representative from your group. So if the Rotary is ever interested in having someone sit on the membership group, what we basically do is talk about what's going on. What's, what can we do with the store to make it better, to keep it going? And then we have an, a board of a president, vice president, that we handle most of the personnel issues and the initial uh, requests that come in. When I talk about requests, uh, if people are wanting some support for 4-H, the welcome table, uh, the, new th the new theater downtown, all of these different things, we ask for a written request. 
uh, we have a certain criteria that we want to meet, and it's basically to keep the community the best possible place we can we can make it. And it might be just helping with the to offset the cost of the furnace at the senior center, or it might be something where um, someone is is having a real medical emergency and they need to be going back and forth to Mayo. We have a grant that you know may go up to several hundred dollars that we can help with travel. Uh, so it all works about uh, around requests. And we can't give every kid that wants to go to camp money because we'd be really running ragged. But, uh, but these are some of the small things that we do. When they redid the nursing home originally, we helped to pay for the uh, beauty shop that went in there because we wanted people to feel good and if you're feeling good and looking good, you're, you know, that's a big part of, of accepting change and, and growth in our lives. Uh, so it's a lot of things that we take a look at. What can we do? And uh, we're kind of that little ripple that keeps moving through the community and what can we do? We consider ourselves the best recyclers in town. So when we had Earth Day, we feel like we've really helped to promote recycling and being an important part of don't just throw everything away. We don't want everybody's stuff because I always look at it, if you're gonna donate something, make sure it's something you'd buy back. That's how we like to say, hmm, have you got some stuff? Because if we get things, uh, um, if we get things that are not usable, then we have to pay for these things to go to the landfill. So we try to keep our expenses down and keep the revenue coming up. I, I'm a promoter of the sieve, but I'm a super shopper in there too. I see Kelsey back there and I just love the fact that through the United Way, she does such a great job, but she's also a big supporter of the store. Um, we, we, support, we went through the uh, uh, St. Agnes style show and luncheon this year, and I always like to bring some clothes in that are from the store and have people model it, and, they all, and they'll say, where the heck did that come from? And I'll say, from the store. We want people to be encouraged to come in and look around. We don't have something for everyone, but we surely have something for most of you. So, especially in these days of repurposing, that's a biggie. So, uh, so we want people to come in some of the other things that we support in town, uh, besides our scholarship, um, we help the welcome table, the backpack program. Um, we've done some things for the newly renovated theater. Um, we do things for the um, uh, busy hands through the arts council, uh, teener baseball. Uh, we just, you know, the requests come in, we take a good look at it and we see if it does fit what we're doing. So we want you to think about this. So when you hear the beloved Civ name, and I tell the kids at the, at the high school too when we talk about these things, it's a place that really supports the community in a lot of different ways. And especially with the staff that we hire, seven full-time people, and we have a manager, and we do some work with the personnel just because we kind of re reinvented ourselves probably uh, 10 years ago. Uh, where the, the uh, board would work in, in a whole different capacity and basically how are we gonna spend the money. We became a much more hands-on group, right, Cindy? <laughs> and, uh, but it's one of those things where you know as volunteers, you better get in there knee deep or you're just not getting the gist of it. So it's, uh, it's really something that we appreciate. But that's what I wanted to talk about the Civic Council today. Uh, not only that it's a good place to shop, but it really supports the community. And that also we have a great partnership with um, Salvation Army and uh, social services and all of the places that show great need, but also other places that just kind of have a request occasionally. So I want you to think about that, even within organizations you know about, uh, and we always need volunteers in the store. So uh, Monday we uh, are not open, but we did go in as volunteers, about five of us, because of the uh, graciousness of people in their closet cleaning this time of the year. Uh, we're loaded with bags of clothing. So we went in and just sorted probably, oh, I'd say 50 to 60 bags of clothes. And that was the tip of the iceberg, the initial sort. We just went through things and that way the staff could come in and do the quality control. We're the, we're the cheap help. And, uh, but we go in and, and do some of these things. But to come in, we need people to help measure fabric we need people to help dust some of the glass stuff occasionally, maybe work in the kitchen, wash some dishes, because we never put dishes out that aren't clean. 
Uh, one really fun thing we did a couple weeks ago was the Theta Omega ESA group in town has a tour of tables every year. It's held at St. Agnes and it's a St. Jude's fundraiser. And you can come in as an individual and I could come in with Aunt Sophie's dishes and set the table up and then you sell each seat at your table for 15 bucks. And then that money goes a little bit to St. Agnes to pay for the luncheon and then the rest of the money goes to St. Jude's. They've been very gracious about letting us come in as the sieve and set up a table with items from the store and it looks fabulous when we're done and then we can sell everything that's at the table and then all of our money goes to St. Jude's. Our 15 bucks a pop plus our, our dish sales. Which, and then it's great marketing, what can I say? You know, If you don't stop long enough in Hy-Vee, I'm gonna talk your leg off anyway. So, uh, But I'm just really proud to be part of an organization that does so much and it's done a lot for me too, because I feel like I've had the opportunity to meet a lot of really great people in town that like to do the same type of thing and, and to work for the community. So, so there's about 10 minutes for the sieve. So I'll shift gears now. And with my retirement three years ago, I was getting myself all shifted around ready to be a super retiree. And I got a text from Dan Christofferson that said, have we got a deal for you? Well, that's the opening line, be cautious, any of you that are still working. Our wonderful friend Cleo Erickson was the history lady. <clears throat> and if you knew this woman, she was gracious, she was giving, she was smart, and man, was she motivated. Um, in the late 60s, our, our beautiful Austin Whittemore house was destined to become a parking lot. And she, she passed away in 68, and uh, her son inherited the house, and it was in tough shape. And so the son was gonna sell the, the house to Tom and Bud's, which was across the street. But there were people in town who knew it was important to hang on to the history of the community. This house had been built in 1882 by Horace Austin and his wife, Rachel. He'd come to uh, Dakota Territory to be a surveyor, to help all these, these Scandinavians primarily that were coming here to settle and they needed some property lines drawn and he was gonna, he, he became a surveyor and he helped to do that. Then he met this beautiful woman who was here to be one of the first teachers at the Dakota Log Schoolhouse, which we have a replica in our yard now. Uh, his, his diary is funny because he was having a serious pity party about he hadn't met a woman yet. And so he finally met Rachel, they married. They had a home below the hill because that's where Vermilion was. And after the flood in 1881, they built this beautiful home up above the hill like a lot of people did. And loved, they were big philanthropists as well. Right, Art? Because he's also on the board. And uh, beautiful home. They actually adopted the baby of the man and his wife who built the house for them, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Pickett. Uh, Mrs. Pickett died shortly after the baby was born and they adopted this little girl named Helen and they called her Pansy. Well, little Pansy ended up growing up in this house, having a wonderful life, married Mr. Whittemore who was the football coach, athletic director for the university in the early 1900s. We have an annual with his picture in it, so that's another thing I'll talk about a little bit too. But uh, so they ended up raising five children in that house. So, and the original house was just a real square house. And if you've been to the house, and I encourage all of you to come and see me because it's fun, it's beautiful, and I want people in there, put life back in the house. They built a whole back section of the house on shortly after Mr. Austin died. Um, so with Mrs. Whittemore being there and raising her children, the house was full of life, full of activity. And then like most families, the kids all grew up and moved away. And she continued to live in the house and it, it lost a little ground, it uh, needed repair. She rented space out in the upstairs of the house. I periodically have someone show up and say, oh my gosh, I, I lived upstairs as a student at USD for a while. And so they'll tell me great stories about uh, meeting her, uh, what kind of experiences had they had with her. And you know, you just start feeling the whole community and how it's bubbled through this house. Uh, one of our uh, members came in one day and said, I used to deliver papers to Mrs. Whittemore when I was a kid. And he could tell me a little bit more about her. For me, I want to get more acquainted with the house and how it has been a part of the community and what it can continue to be as a part of the community. 
So when Mrs. Uh, Whittemore died in 1968, the house sat empty for a couple of years, the kids were all gone, and their only son, Arthur Jr., and they called him Bucky, was living in New York, and he was a very uh, well-known musician. He and Jack Lowe uh, formed the uh, Whittemore and Lowe piano duo, and they traveled all over the country and some places around the world to play. He'd come back periodically to play on campus because this was his home turf. He, too, had gone to the university. But he didn't really want to take the expense and the time to fix the house up when he, when he inherited it, so uh, the grocers offered him a deal, and he was going for it. But... The president of the university at the time was, was uh, Bowen, and his wife, Connie, lived in Jesse's house, Jesse Wilhelm's house, and Connie hit the ground running, and she said, we can't see that, that beautiful old house go by the wayside. So she hit Cleo Erickson and anyone else that didn't move fast enough, and they created a, a wonderful group of people that Cleo talked about. They set up a mimeograph machine in her living room and ran off a bunch of stuff. A phone book could give you every name in, in town. So they whipped out letters, sent it to everybody and said, we are making some money. We want to save this house. Well, they finally talked Bucky into giving them the house because they got a good tax write-off. But then he needed, he wanted some cash for the lots around it. So as you see the yard now, they had to come up with the money. So all of a sudden, okay, that's going to work. But all of a sudden, they're kind of like deer in the headlights. Yow, <laughs> now what do we do? So we've got a house. So they, um, they created the Clay County Historical Society. Got their bylaws in order, started uh, fundraising like all of us do. And... Uh, and started making really big plans and worked with the State Historical Society, State Historic Preservation, because they were going to have to recreate this house to be as close to what it had been before. And boy, they went to town. So it took volunteer work again. They'd hire the tradesmen, the plumbers, the electricians, the people they had to have to do the, the big stuff like that. But I still talk with people all the time who were the, the wallpaperers, the painters, the, you know, everything that needed to be done. They really put time into it and effort, and now we have this beautiful house. What I'm trying to do now, I, when people say, oh, you know, gosh, you're the new history lady, because if you knew Cleo, she had the plates on her car that said history lady, and she was. She just had blood, sweat, and tears into that house. She had really given a lot of her life to the house, accepting items in the house because they had to buy all the furniture or they got things donated, but they created this wonderful file system because the information we have on families in that house is only as good as you all help it be. I'm not going to go out and go to Ancestry.com and try to find out everything about you. That'd be a little creepy. But uh, I, if you have information on your businesses, your family, even though you may not have grown up in Clay County, you're here now. You're here because you are involved in a business of some kind. I'd love to get information on all of the things that you do here, that you're invested in, so that in 30 years when somebody comes back in, they're going to say, hey, I wonder what Michelle really, how did she get started here? That would be interesting to have a little bit of information because people want to know about that stuff. Today is tomorrow's history. So that's how I'm trying to help build up um, files on families and things. We have a great obituary file because some of these original members would cut every obituary out of a newspaper they could get in Clay County, and they set up this little card file. And so if somebody died in 1960, they'd cut that out of the paper. There's a little card thing. And you'd be amazed at how many people stop in that may be from Wisconsin, and they pop in and say, you know, I think I had an uncle, Olaf Jensen. I'll go in under Jensen, see if there's an Olaf, and... Uh, and there may be something in there. It's amazing how what you can see in, in an obituary. Uh, family names, where did they come from? People have found family members they didn't know existed. So these are some of the interesting things that are in the house. Uh, thanks to the uh, Clay County Historic Preservation, they had a grant written several years ago, and Mrs. Carlson did research on every uh, cemetery in Clay County. So, and I, and I just say this because I mean it wholeheartedly. I know more about dead people now than I used to. But, you know, it's really interesting if somebody comes in that they're wanting to know something about their family. There's a real connection there. 
So this wonderful bunch of books that I have is wonderful. So that's a part of our resource. Uh, I mentioned that I have uh, USD yearbooks that go back to 1903. And we've gotten these because somebody has said, oh, we're, we're cleaning out Uncle Leroy's you know, house and there are some USD yearbooks here. Do you want them? Yeah. So I have a list of which ones we have, which ones we need. So the Civic Council calls me, got my foot in the door there, and they'll say, have you got this yearbook? Because we just got one in. So we really have used those a lot as people do research on, on folks that may have come to school here. I have a limited amount of uh, Vermilion High School annuals because for some reason people aren't wanting to give those up because of all that goofy writing that you did in the front. Oh, remember the part? Yeah, well, they're not giving those up. But I do have some. So I'll have to talk about briefly about one project that I'm, I'm crazy about. And when I was leaving the School of Ed, I met a young woman named Jing An. She was hired to be the new social studies teacher. And she said, boy, I really look forward to working with you. And I said, I'm retiring. So we happened to run into each other within the year. And she was talking about wanting to do some research projects so these soon-to-be teachers will know how to find resources. So I talked about maybe, you know, when they go into a community, how they can find their local historical society and see, do they have a house? Do they not? Do they have records? What do they have? And boy, we've started really having some great projects. And the biggie we've been having lately that works with the uh, local VFW is something called the Fallen Heroes. And what they do is uh, the VFW comes up with names of of, of uh, people who either were in World War I, II, Korean War, or Vietnam War that died in the war or as a result of it. They choose a name because they have no clue who this person's gonna be, and then they just go to town. They go to see what they can find out. So she invites a lot of us in uh, from ID Weeks, from the public library, I get to come in, and we just talk about, hey, if you're looking for something on these people, stop in. You never know what you're gonna find in here. And so out of like 20 kids in the class, you know, some will come in and I'd say probably um, a dozen of those students came to the house. And you can see when the spark gets lit. And it was this year, wow, I was so impressed with these students that they would come back and they would come back and they would come back. And we could send them once we saw, okay, here's James Fouche died in Vietnam. He was one of the only people who died from Vermilion in the Vietnam War. And a lot of you who grew up here probably knew the Fouge family. When these guys came in to research this person, we were able to send them to the Catholic Church, to all sorts of different places where they could get more information. Because we just felt like if we don't have it, we're a part of the community. We're gonna find people that may have known this person. We sent, uh, we sent people to see the guy who had been uh, a teacher at the school and knew James Fouche. And as it turned out, two of these boys, who young men, who worked on this particular same James Fouche, uh, we got them in contact with his only surviving brother in Pierre. So this whole thing just turned out to be one of the most moving experiences I've ever worked on watching these young people who will be teachers catch on fire about wanting to know more and more. So I loved it when they said, well, come on to the presentation. All 20 kids are gonna do their presentations. Okay, so I went in one day, it was five o'clock and they had the VFW guys there and James Fouche's brother was there from Pierre. And so all 20 of them did their their proposals, they'd already submitted them so that the judging was going on with the VFW because they were going to be helping, not only were they getting grades on these projects, but they were also in entering into a competition with the VFW. They wanted to see what kind of interest had taken place here. And so of the top five that they chose, four of them had come to the house and done a lot of research. Actually, all five of them had been there, but four of them had really gotten the bug. And the kid who won the, the number one spot was my real buddy, Joe. And he had come back and come back. And he is a Marine. He's back in school. His wife is in law school. He'd had the opportunity during this project to go see his wife in Washington, D.C. So he'd done a rubbing 
on the Vietnam War Memorial for James Fuchs's name. So this whole thing was just, it started with, hey, come to the house and see what we have. So this is what I invite all of you to do. Come to the house and see what we have. And come to the house and see what you can help make the Clay County Historical Society even be more. You know, we're, we're proud of the fact that, you know, volunteer board members. So it's, you know, we have a president, vice president, treasurer, you know, membership. <clears throat> You're going to see our brochure on the table. <clears throat> Fresh from pressing matters today. Uh, we're still working on it. Uh, but we function like every other nonprofit organization. Uh, we, of course, feel like anybody who lives here or has a business here should be a part of this because you are a part of the history of Clay County whether you grew up here or not. But I think we're really proud of the, of the fact that we have, a, we have the opportunity to have a house. And so uh, we wanna keep it growing. Uh, one of the things I did enter into the uh, brochure is that we want people to use the house. We have fundraising events like our tour of homes in December, our sweets and treats, our ice cream social, all kinds of things like this. We're having a rummage sale the 20th of May. If you're cleaning your closets, feel free to bring us some stuff. But we have events, and Tim uh, is a member of the Friends of Public Broadcasting. Are you still on the board? Okay. So what, what they did for that was, if you were ever watching public television and got hooked into Downton Abbey, <laughs> I was a junkie. Uh, this was a great English series. And when the show was wrapping up, they asked these board members, in your community, have a little farewell tea. So they did. It was great fun. They invited people to come in costume, and wear a fancy hat, but you know, events. We have small business meetings in there. If you're wanting a quiet place, uh, uh, that there isn't a lot of stuff going on, come to the house. Uh, we have bridal showers, baby showers. We had two weddings in the gazebo. Uh, we're, we're having all sorts of uh, different meetings, family reunions. I have four students coming this weekend to have their USD family party after graduation. Because they came in to do a little tour at Christmas time, so as the carnival barker that I am, I just happened to mention, you know, if you kids are from out of town and you need a place to invite your family so that it's a nice kind of intimate, friendly place, think about it. So the four girls are coming with their families on Saturday. We do not have a set fee, but we negotiate donations. So it's all about that. So this is in a nutshell what the Historical Society is doing in this county. You know, we're all about Burbank and Wakanda, where I grew up, of course, and all of these wonderful, the Olson community. We have their old phone system in the house. We have, we have wonderful things that uh, we people have thought are worth preserving. And we think the history that you're all helping to create now is worth preserving too. So I thank you as a group for all the work you do here and, and what you do all over the country and internationally. Uh, and we hope that you'll consider uh, coming to see me at the house. I'm there Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 10 to 2, unless I've got a grandkid thing in Sioux Falls and then I just leave the clothes sign on the door. But, uh, but I, I thank you for inviting me today and uh, letting me come in and talk to you about uh, how excited we are about uh, it's not just the history of then, it's what history we can create now and how you can all be a part of it too. Thank you. I told you more than you ever wanted to know, but you know, uh, anytime you have any questions or want to know anything about what we might be able to do for your business, uh, if you've got uh, a thought about having a, an event at the house, or how you'd like to help support the house, 